So welcome to lecture number 16. Um, we discussed last time about the earth structure. We'll just have to do a little review, a short review on the rheologic layers. And I'll uh, explain to you why we need to do this uh, short review. And then we, we start discussing about the theory of plate tectonics. And here, uh, the sub chapters, if you want, of this uh, uh, chapter on the theory of plate tectonics, uh, will briefly touch upon the um, views that were prior, tectonic views that were prior to that this theory and um, its significance. And we'll discuss about the hypothesis of continental drift and seafloor spreading and uh, about various observations that are explained by this theory. Um, one thing is, uh, I assume that you already had an introduction uh, regarding the plate tectonics in the classes of Heosciencias and uh, Heologia General. Uh, so I think you know what, uh, what it is about, but what we'll do now, we'll take this view of trying to understand why, to what extent we can, we can rely on it. Um, it's not just that we present, this is it, you know, we are uh, developing as scientists and we have to, to see if uh, this gets closer to the truth or not. So um, when it comes to the rheologic layers, I just want to remind you about the fact that as you can see here, the seismically defined layer in terms of crust, mantle, and the core with the two parts of the core. We already discussed about this, but now our, our focus is on the crust and uh, or the upper part, uh, the crust and the upper part of the mantle, uh, which together the crust and this uh, upper part of the mantle called also lithospheric mantle, uh, they form the lithosphere. Uh, and we talk about the lithosphere in the context of lithospheric plates. So if you remember last time, we discussed about this division uh, from a rheological perspective uh, of the material here at the top of the lithosphere in the lithospheric mantle and asteroid mantle. And if you remember, we were uh, looking at things like this, just this is a brief review um, as I was just saying, the lithosphere has a crust and the uppermost part of the mantle. Um, and the lithosphere behaves rigidly on geologic time scale. So, so it is rigid. You, uh, if a load uh, is placed on it, could be, a, uh, let's say, a continental ice cap, like today in Antarctica or Greenland. Uh, the lithosphere can support it to a certain point or at some point it bends. It depends on the flexural rigidity, which means resistance to bending of the lithosphere. Underneath the lithosphere is still mantle. Uh, there's no, no difference, compositionally speaking, be between the lithospheric mantle and the asteroid The boundary is defined as the uh, 1250 uh, degrees Celsius isotherm. It is, uh, Consider that below these uh, isotherms, so that means above this temperature, the peridotite behaves plastically, so it it, it flows. Uh, there is no flex flexural rigidity over geologic time scale. Of course, very fast. It is kind of uh, like any solid material. You you can have um, elastic waves propagating through it, but over geologic time scale, it yields. Uh, it is not rigid. So that's the idea, lithosphere and asteroid So this was just a very short review, just a reminder of these two concepts. And now what we are gonna do, we'll go and discuss the theory of plate tectonics. Now, normally this is taught by saying, well, this is the case, but let's see what the meaning of this word theory is. So let's start, to, we have a hierarchy here, a hierarchy. So when you talk about the fact, it's a bit of truth. Yeah, let's say you go in the field, you take a measurement with the compass of uh, the deep direction of, a, let's say, of a layer. 
And uh, that's a fact. You say, well, this uh, layer is oriented towards, uh, it trends toward uh, 30 degrees uh, towards the Northeast. Um, it's um, dipping, I don't know, 50 degrees. Th this is a fact. Now, when we talk about the hypothesis, we talk about an idea that uh, has the potential to explain some observations. So, for instance, let's say you make some geologic measurements, and um, then you can, uh, they are disparate because you don't have continuous outcrop, but then you see this layer here, and uh, you see, see a similar rock here, and a similar rock here, and in between you, you cannot see it, and they have more or less the same orientation, the same dip, so your hypothesis would be, well, we are talking about the same, about the same layer that you can see in some afloimentos uh, here and there, but the hypothesis is uh, it explains the observations. Now, the model, the model is, uh, is trying to, to have a more comprehensive view. So basically you want to have a coherent explanation for many facts for many facts, so that's the idea. Uh, and the model should allow for predictions. So uh, a model should be based on observations. Yeah, it fits the observations, but allows you to make some predictions beyond what you can see at this moment. Um, and also if, you know, the predictions are proven wrong, then uh, if, if they are not verified, then the model is wrong. Yeah? So that's the idea of a model. and. You know, nowadays in science, we talk about models all the time. Right? It's our representation of reality. Now, here is the jump. It is like the jump from the uh, colonel to, uh, to the general yeah, in the army. <laughs> so uh, the idea is that we go from the model to the theory. So the theory is a model, but it is a very solid one. It's a, a robust one. It can... Uh, basically account, it fits many, many facts, many observations, and it allows predictions, numerous predictions to, to be made and be verified. So uh, the difference between the model and theory is that the theory is a model, so there's no doubt about it, but it has been proven in many instances, so it's very robust. However, uh, the theory, must be falsifiable. What this means, it means that it, there must be a, a way to prove it wrong if that were the case. So it, it has to allow for predictions and facts that should be verified. And uh, these predictions, these predictions, uh, if one of them is not verified, some of these important predictions, that shows you that the model is false. So. So you cannot say that you have a theory if, you, if it is not falsifiable, if it does not have the mechanism to prove it wrong if it were wrong. For instance, one of the problems, if you know in physics today, is in theoretical physics, is that people talk about the uh, very deep structure of the universe, of the matter, uh, and they come up with things like the string theory. Well, the problem is how to uh, how to prove it or how to falsify it. Yeah, that's the thing, right? because it, it's become very theoretical and we don't have the means to actually prove or disprove it. <laughs> that's the, the idea. So in the case of, um, of the earth sciences, nowadays the dominant theory or thinking in terms of the way the dynamics of the lithosphere uh, occur are explained by or described by this theory. Now, there is a strong difference between a theory and the law. When we talk about the law, this is something that it's the, like the difference between a theorem and an axiom yeah, in mathematics. Like the law is something that is always verified by experiments. And actually, it sits at the foundation of our understanding of the universe, of the reality, uh, the law of gravity, yeah, that is the law. A theory is a model. It can be falsified if some predictions are not 
uh, uh, are not verified. So that's the idea. Now that you have this, this overview of the terminology, uh, you can see that we call it theory of plate tectonics because uh, most of the geoscientists think that it is a very robust model. So here is some text that I put in so that you can read it. Uh, I'm not going to read every word here, but I want to discuss a bit the tectonic views prior to this theory of plate tectonics. Like what were people thinking? What you are going to the university before the uh, middle of the previous century, the 1950s, if you are going to the university, what would they teach you in terms of the tectonics? So the idea is that for a long time, uh, geologists thought, uh, you know, the main problem is how to explain these major features, like the orogenic belts, the mountains, for instance. It, it is, uh, people have been intrigued and people have noticed that they have layers, sedimentary layers that were formed on the bottom of the sea with fossils and everything, now sitting up in the topography of a mountain belt. So the question is, what forces, what, how can this be explained? So prior to the plate tectonic, uh, plate tectonic sphere, um, there were several hypotheses, uh, but the dominant one were, was the geosyncline hypothesis. So the geosyncline hypothesis, and th there were, were many books and articles published on this. Um, basically, people were thinking that you have, you must have um, a sedimentary basin um, somewhere along the margins of the continents, because they noticed that these mountain belts very often go along margins of continents. So you must have, uh, must have had a sedimentary basin which uh, was undergoing subsidence so that you would have thick packages of layers accumulated there. And the question is, what brought the layers up from the, from the bottom of the sea in this, in this uh, trough, if you want, uh, to, to have this positive topography? And one idea was that, for instance, they would, the layers, the sedimentary layers would sink deep enough that uh, they would start melting and the resulting magma would rise up and uh, this would deform and metamorphose the uh, surrounding rock. But also the, uh, another very strong hypothesis was the contracting earth hypothesis. And the contracting earth hypothesis, I think that this was uh, the strongest argument. The idea was that, um, over time, over geologic time, the earth has been contracting. So when you contract, you have to accommodate the initial larger surface of, of uh, the planet to a smaller surface, yeah? So that means that it shrinks. Imagine like you have a fruit, like, uh, I don't know, mango or a, an apple, and it starts drying and it, it becomes smaller, yeah? And you see the wrinkles in, um, on the surface of it. So the idea, uh, the idea is that people were thinking that the contracting would provide the forces necessary for the shrinking, for the shrinking of the um, crust uh, of the lithosphere, which would lead to the formation of the mountain belts. So uh, I wouldn't say that it's unreasonable. I mean, if this were the case, if if you have this shrinking, it, it is reasonable. However, uh, you can see that with the contracting earth hypothesis, people started realizing that this fits some observations. They would go into uh, and look at the sections uh, in the origins, and they would see that you have, you must have had contraction. Yeah, you must have had contraction. So horizontal forces. So the question was, what is dominant, horizontal forces or vertical forces? And of course, with the contracting earth hypothesis, this would provide the horizontal forces. Now, today, as the, this second text says, the scientific dispute uh, is settled in the sense that I think everyone accepts that today, dominantly, are these horizontal forces. The question is where they are coming for, from. And the current theory suggests that the origin of these horizontal forces is not in the shrinking earth, it is in the uh, dynamics of plate tectonics. 
All right, so um, thinking about this, this was initially uh, what people were thinking. Now we have this theory that we are going to discuss. What's the, its significance? So the significance is that it is considered to be a geotectonic theory. It's comprehensive. It, it explains basically um, a lot of facts and observations. Um, and these are major ones, like the distinction you remember, we discussed about the fact that we have two types of crust, continental and oceanic. Um, and why? Why we have this on Earth and we don't have it on other planets, as you've seen. Um, and it explains the origin of mountain belts and various other observations like distribution of earthquakes, volcano, volcanoes, different rock types. So, so uh, in the mid and second part of the um, 20th century, there was this revolution in the ideas of uh, geologists with regards to uh, to actually the dynamics of the planet. And um, so far, uh, people are still adherent to, to this uh, theory. Um, we will see that at the end of the course that there are people who think differently. And I would say we should not completely dismiss them. Um, so my point is to open, uh, open uh, the horizon to all of you so that you can think on your own. No, I don't want to feed to you things that say this is like this. It's just that you have to start thinking. It's very, very uh, interesting and I would say um, exciting to think about these things. All right, so let's go into the actual theory. And uh, at the base of the theory, there are two hypotheses that built this model, which became very robust and we call it the theory. And these two um, hypotheses, our, one is um, the continental drift hypothesis. The other one is called the seafloor spreading. Continental drift uh, has a hero, and this, uh, this is Alfred Wegener. He was a German scientist. You can see he died when he was 50 years old. Um, and he was not a geologist, actually. He was a meteorologist. Um, he was uh, doing polar research. He was interested in uh, explaining the flow of air uh, in the polar regions and things like this. Uh, but still, he was the one who proposed the continental drift hypothesis, basically saying that the continents have been together in a, uh, at some point in the past in a supercontinent that is called Pangaea that broke apart. And um, <clears throat> What I could say about Wegener is that his idea was not accepted at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, he faced a lot of criticism and resistance, and I can understand it. I mean, it, it, it sounds crazy. You, you, there is some guy who comes and tells you that the continents, which are huge masses, would just move around. And you'd say, well, okay, how? <laughs> how? But they move around. And he would say, well, they would plow, they would kind of plow through the oceanic crust. And the geologists would say, well, but the oceanic crust is very rigid. I mean, how, how would they plow through the oceanic crust? I mean, it makes no sense to us, and you cannot explain it. So why should we accept? And his arguments were based, as you can see, his sketch of the continents and the fit of the coastlines. Um, people would say, well, yeah, but this is not such a strong argument. I mean, it still cannot explain the dynamics of this. So he, uh, he never saw his uh, ideas accepted. He died, um, he died in Greenland, actually. What he did, he, he was doing these uh, expeditions. As I was saying, he was interested in polar research. So he was going on the ice cap. And um, I think he went to supply a camp. They had camps on the uh, um, <clears throat> ice cap and um, then trying to reach another camp, he died. He collapsed. He was with a partner, a younger partner. That partner buried him um, and um, that partner vanished. He never got to the other camp as well. So uh, the idea is that um, 
a Wegener died uh, doing what he was writing. Anyway, so what happens is uh, nowadays he's considered a visionary from the point of view of the theory of plate tectonics. Um, let's look at the arguments in support of this continental drift hypothesis. So one of them I just mentioned, it would be the fit of the continent's coastlines. Now, the coastlines, there is one thing people were bringing this counter argument. They would say, well, but the, the sea level would go up and down. So why would why would the continents fit where the sea level is today? And Wegener said, no, no, it's not where it is today. It is where the basically we have the continental shelf. We, and uh, we can try to fit them where we have the continental shelf and they fit. Um, but our arguments, our observations were like this. You see the what's called the distribution of late Paleozoic glaciations. So basically, there are regions where you have deposits that uh, reflect these gla glaciations, continental glaciations that existed uh, at, uh, in late Paleozoic. And by looking at the distribution of these of these deposits, uh, gla glaciated terrain uh, from that time, you can see that if you were to have these continents together, uh, basically it would make sense. Yeah, you you uh, this distribution, and also you would have distribution of what's called paleoclimatic belts. So the idea is you'd see zones were that were tropical uh, in the Paleozoic. So you would have cold deposits, you would have reefs, yeah, indicating a, a tropical climate. And if the continents were together, you'd see the uh, how they align very nicely. Uh, the tropical and subtropical um, uh, climatic belts. So these were arguments in support of this continental drift hypothesis. Uh, another one comes from paleontology. In paleontology, uh, yes, <laughs> well, okay. yes, David, uh, you were a bit ahead of uh, of me. So uh, this was another argument: the distribution of different fossil species uh, in late Paleozoic or the Mesozoic, uh, that you can find the uh, basically the these fossils on different continents, but these fossils are not fossils that you would expect them to swim, uh, the, the animals or the plants would expect them to swim and populate the different continents. So the argument was basically that they having a large continental mass, that subsequently split apart. Basically, this would explain the distribution and existence of these these examples of these fossils. And you see, this is very famous. This uh, plant called Glossopteris, for instance. And you have here an image of it. So uh, these are the arguments. Uh, another one, and I would say this is a quite interesting and strong one. This is one that is closer to to aspects that I consider. Uh, in the things that I'm doing, uh, which are mineral exploration, um, is the matching of rock assemblages that nowadays are on different continents. So, for instance, if you look at this uh, part of the southern continent, uh, you can see if you were to, to fit South America and Africa, and you would have basically this matching of the uh, Archean crust, we discussed about cratons, yeah, we discussed about this. So if you look at the Amazon craton here, and uh, you look here at the uh, West African craton, uh, it kind of makes sense. And in between the cratons, uh, these Archean parts of the cratons, they are uh, basically united by Proterozoic mountain belts. And these mountain belts, they extend across the boundaries of the continents, you, you see. And uh, there is a lot of research. The, uh, there are papers published by scientists in Brazil, uh, a lot trying to make these correlations with the terrains in Africa. You see in the Congo Craton and in the South African Craton. Um, so that's the idea. All right, so uh, the other example here is what I was telling you uh, when we, I briefly mentioned the uh, young orogenic belts, the Appalachians, as 
actually being part of a large origin that has remnants today in North America and we call them the Appalachians, but the Caledonites in uh, Scandinavia, uh, in Norway, for instance, and you see also in uh, the British Isles and uh, the origin on the eastern side of Greenland and the part on the eastern side of North Africa. So this is these were actually one origin which was split apart by the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. So very interesting things. And uh, I would say that these arguments are uh, strong arguments. I mean, uh, they at least this hypothesis explains that. <laughs> now let's look at the other hypothesis, uh, which is the seafloor spreading hypothesis. And uh, this, uh, so Wegener was a German. Uh, we are uh, talking here about uh, about Harry Hess, and uh, he was an American. He was an American professor uh, of geology, and but he also served in the U.S. Navy. So he got very interested in uh, the geology of the oceans and of the um, of the uh, oceanic crust. So he came up with this hypothesis. He was basically saying uh, that. You know, from the bathymetry, uh, we learned uh, there were measurements yeah, in the oceans, and we discovered the um, existence of the so-called mid-ocean ridges, yeah, these mountain belts, these belts, if you want, uh, on the bottom of the oceans. Um, and the idea is that Harry Hess was saying, well, what happens here where we have the mid-ocean ridges uh, there is new oceanic crust being formed because there is um, there is um, magma that rises up and forms this crust. And then what happens, the seafloor spreads, is pushed by new magma, is pushed, so it spreads symmetrically away from the ridge axis uh, in two different opposite directions. Uh, so basically, if you have continents on each side, of the mid-ocean ridge, basically the, the continents would drift apart, yeah, would move apart. Uh, and uh, eventually the ocean floor would, um, would sink back into the mantle. So this uh, oceanic lithosphere would be, would be heavy and would sink back. Um, and this would be, these locations where it sinks back um, are marked topographically by the deep oceanic trenches, like the Mariana Trench. For instance, and we have earthquakes there, so this is evidence for this movement and so on. So this was the hypothesis that was proposed by Harry Hess. Now Harry Hess, as you can see, uh, Wegener was earlier in time, so he had he stood no chance. Now Harry Hess did uh, did stand some chance to uh, basically see his hypothesis accepted. So uh, he, you know. Uh, lived through the 60s until 1969. So people were starting to accept and discuss about these things. So what would be the observations that are explained by this hypothesis would be, for instance, that the sediment layer, so on the ocean floor, you have sed a sediment, a layer of sediment. It varies in thickness. So at the mid-ocean ridge where, where new oceanic crust is being formed, you have virtually no sediment. And then as you go towards the margin of the ocean, the sedimentary pile, uh, so the, the accumulation of sediment is thicker and thicker and thicker. So this is one observation. Um, then uh, the, what's interesting, here at the margin where it's at its thicker part, this uh, pile of sediment actually is too thin to have been accumulating for the entire history of the Earth. So that basically would tell you that something happens that the age of the oceans is limited. Um, so this would basically fit the idea that the uh, oceanic lithosphere is recycled back into the mantle. And also uh, another observation which is interesting is that the oceanic crust itself is different from the continental crust. So only basalt, only gabbro. So again, we are talking about a process that we don't see on, on the continents. And also at the mid-ocean ridges, you have high heat flow. So this would would kind of fit the idea of uh, Harry Hess that at the mid-ocean ridges, you have magma rising up 
uh, to form the, the new crust. So the idea is what observations, what observations basically uh, we can make and uh, our arguments in support of this hypothesis. So look at this. Uh, this, let's say you take samples, ocean floor samples of basalt and measure, uh, determine the age. So what's the age when the ocean floor was formed? So what's interesting, and you, you can see on this map, uh, if you look, for instance, here uh, um, in the Atlantic or in the in Indian Ocean, uh, what you can see very nicely, you can see that basically as you go farther away from the mid-ocean ridge, the age of the basalt increases. And there is a limit. that You, you can see we, we don't have oceanic basalt older than the Jurassic time. So um, that shows us that um, something happens to the uh, oceanic crust that it's no longer there, older one. So this is one of the arguments in favor of uh, that supports the hypothesis of Harry Hess. And um, here we have three new guys who came after Harry Hess and actually validated his hypothesis. This was, I would say, the, uh, you know, uh, when you have the final strongest argument to say, well, this guy was right. So what they did, uh, this is a story in, in science that um, Vine and Matthews, they published this paper. Well, what they did, they did magnetic surveys of the ocean floor and they saw magnetic anomalies and the, these magnetic anomalies were positive and negative anomalies. So basically imagine some stripes like here of uh, positive and negative anomaly and positive and negative anomaly and so on. And these stripes would be symmetric to the uh, mid ocean ridge. So the idea was what these stripes reflected, uh, positive and negative, we haven't studied yet uh, geophysics. So we haven't studied the magnetic method and so on. But the Earth's magnetic field undergoes inversions, uh, inversions of polarity during the geologic time. We don't understand exactly why they happen, but the idea is you, you can have a period of time with one polarity, like the polarity we have today, with the North magnetic pole and the South magnetic pole. And in the past, they were flipped. And in the future, I would expect them to flip again and so on. So the idea is that when you have magma or lava solidifying, so becoming a rock, the temperature becomes at some point low enough. So it goes through what is called the Curie temperature. And minerals, magnetic minerals like magnetite, below the Curie temperature, they acquire a magnetization. The magnetization they acquire has the direction of the magnetic field, the inducing magnetic field at the time the rock formed. So let's say if the basalt forms today, it will acquire the direction of the magnetic field today. But let's say one million years ago, when the field was reversed, the basalt that formed then acquired the magnetization in the opposite direction. Uh, according to the inducing field at that time. So basically, uh, Vine and Matthews realized that these stripes that are parallel, yeah, they basically, and they are symmetric relative to the mid-ocean ridge, they reflect the addition of new basalt in geologic time. And the new basalt, let's say the basalt is uh, to form today is like this and acquires the magnetization of today. But then later, 500,000 years later, there is new basalt penetrating here, pushing these two in two parts and acquiring a new magnetization, which is opposite. And then so on, this, they said, this explains this pattern of the magnetic anomalies uh, on the bottom of the seafloor. Now, here is a bit of history of this um, <laughs> uh, discovery. Actually, uh, Vine and Matthews, Vine was a graduate student and um, of Frederick Vine, he's still alive. German Matthews, he was his supervisor. 
but Lord Ernst Morley, he was a Canadian. He had no uh, nothing to do with Vine and Matthews. He indep independently, he thought about this. He was studying the same magnetic pattern and he thought about this. And he wrote a paper and sent it to a journal to be published. And the journal rejected the paper. They said, well, this is local. I mean, that's, it cannot be like this. So they rejected his paper. Vine and Matthews published their paper, which was saying the same thing one year later or a few months later. So everyone was recognizing because the journal, uh, I think it was Nature, recognized, uh, you know, the basically the discovery of Vine and Matthews. And it was called, well, the Vine and Matthews uh, paper. Everyone was talking about them as heroes and so on. But the truth is that Morley was <laughs> was faster than than them and independent. So nowadays, we as the geoscience community have to recognize him as well because the journal actually rejected his paper and uh, unfortunately, yeah. So this happens actually in the history of science. Anyway, so this is the idea. So this is a very strong argument uh, that supports the hypothesis of Harry Hess. So you can see now here uh, what I was talking about. So let's look at the uh, ridge here at the mid ocean ridge, uh, Reykjanes ridge, uh, you see southwest of um, Iceland here. And look at the pattern, yeah? So the pattern here shows this is the, today the mid ocean ridge. And you see these symmetric magnetic stripes. This is one polarity, then another polarity and the another polarity and so on. So here you see this Gilbert, Gauss, Matuyama, Brunhes, all these are the polarity ages, yeah? So these are the names of researchers uh, in the magnetic field domain. And uh, we, their names were given to these ages of uh, different polarities. So you can see these stripes. You can see what the recordings were looking like, yeah? So basically, Vine, Mathis, and Morley analyzed this type of recordings. You can see basically the uh, various ages, the various ages of the uh, normal and uh, reverse polarity of the magnetic field. Um, and this is the dynamics. Imagine if today were to, uh, or at some point in the past, let's say, where this uh, part of basalt be formed, then it is pushed by a new part and then by a new part and by a new part and so on. And which acquires the polarity at the time it forms. So you have like a conveyor belt that pushes the two sides of the ocean apart. So this is a seafloor spraying hypothesis and it was validated by these interpretations. So if we bring together the two hypotheses, continental drift, which has these observations on the continents and the observations regarding the seafloor and the hypothesis regarding, to, uh, regarding uh, the seafloor, these two hypotheses form this robust model that we today call the theory of plate tectonics. So that's how we got there. Um, and what it says in a nutshell is that the lithosphere of the earth is divided into plates. These plates move relative to one another and relative to the underlying asthenosphere. So now you see why I had to, to uh, do a little review of what the lithosphere and asthenosphere is. And what happens, they are more or less rigid as uh, these plates interact. And the rigidity exists in their interiors, but the, the boundaries, the plates undergo deformation. That's the idea, they, they undergo deformation. That's why we have actually mountain belts at the margins of the plates where they interact. So you have, we, uh, we have different types of boundaries. We have boundaries that are called ridge and you see the ridges are these uh, bold black lines and you see them. So it's, these are divergent boundaries. And then you have something called trench or collision zone, like on the west side of South America, for instance, yeah, and Central America. So what happens here, you have the process of subduction. So they, they are convergent 
the movement is convergent. And then you have something called transform. Uh, um, and the transform are transform folds. We'll talk about the transform folds, but you see the ridge is not one segment, it's segmented. And the basically the transmission of movement from one segment to another is accommodated by these transform folds, which have strike slip movement. So these are the, the three types of boundaries between plates. So you see the plates have different names like South American plate and North American plate and Eurasian plate and the Pacific plate, you see. So these are the, the various names of the plates. All right, now um, let's look at uh, observations that are explained by this model. So the observations, the earthquake belts, if you look at the uh, belts of the um, Focus. Yeah, this is the the, fo uh, the focus of an earthquake is a point where there is a sudden discharge of energy through a rupture uh, or movement along a fault. So basically, the earthquakes uh, are distributed, as you can see, along plate margins, which makes sense because that's where the interaction between the plates occurs. So you would expect that. Uh, that there you have uh, these earthquakes being developed. So, of course, you see earthquakes, um, shallow earthquakes, you see here the legend, shallow earthquakes in the case of the mid-ocean ridges, like here, as you can see. But then you have from shallow to deep ones when it comes to the earthquakes uh, that correspond to the zones of subduction, because we would expect that there you have some process associated with this sinking of the oceanic lithosphere into the mantle that would generate earthquakes. So this is one interesting observation. Another one is that the boundaries of the uh, of the plates can be sharp. Yeah. So as you can see, some boundaries are very sharp. Look look at the mid ocean ridges and where you have the transform faults and so on. So sharp boundaries, but some boundaries, if you define the boundaries as those zones where you have this deformation, uh, this interaction are diffuse. And the, they are more diffuse when the boundaries are within continental crust. You see the oceanic lithosphere is very rigid. So those geologists in the past, when they dismissed Wegener's, uh, Alfred Wegener's uh, idea, they had, uh, they, they were not people who were not thinking. They were saying, well, how can you explain this? Because the oceanic sphere is very rigid. I mean, come on, uh, you know, the continental lithosphere, yeah, it's kind of uh, different. And with the, the deformation would happen in it uh, over a wider region. And you can see, you can see, for instance, look here at the, at the boundary between uh, Africa and the Eurasian plate. So very diffuse, yeah, uh, the boundary here. Here in California as well, because the boundary is within the continental lithosphere. All right, so interesting observations, I'd say. Now, I have to tell you a bit, but just a bit, this slide, um, about the Euler poles. And I think Maria will uh, talk about them as well uh, if she hasn't yet. But the idea is that the plates, they all move, they all move on something which is spherical you know, on the <laughs> surface of the planet. So Euler, who was a mathematician, he had this theorem that the idea is that you, if you have an object on the surface of a sphere, and if, if the object moves on the surface of a sphere, this movement basically occurs by rotation, by rotation, and then you must have an axis relative to which the rotation exists, uh, which axis must pass through the center of the sphere. And basically, the intersection between this axis and the surface of the sphere would be the Euler pole. So the idea is that uh, when we talk about the kinematics, yeah, 
the kinematics of the plate movement, uh, this can be described by using what would be the Euler pole of a certain continental mass. Like it moves like this. So if we imagine and approximate the Earth as a sphere, uh, it the continent basically rotates relative to which axis. Yeah. So that's the idea of the Euler pole. It's a geometrical, um, a geometrical. Uh, idea. All right. So now that you know about this, we can <laughs> we can move. You can read this uh, text. So obviously, it makes a lot of sense because there are people who study the plate motions and the velocities. For instance, the velocities. When we talk about the uh, movement of the plates, we talk about centimeters per year, and uh, something like two centimeters, one, three. And Wegener was thinking maybe it's 250 centimeters per year, so 100 times more. So again, people dismissed him, said, well, come on, what is this? Um, so here, what you can see, you see the plates, and you see this would be relative, where you see uh, arrows, double arrows like this, you would have relative plate motion. So you can say, the re what's the relative plate motion? So one plate, relative to the other as if it were fixed or the absolute plate mo motion so actually what is the velocity of the plate absolute not relative to the other plate because each of them moves so that's the idea so you can see here relative uh, velocities here uh, like 17 so 17 here or 18 here would say that this part moves 17 centimeters uh, per year relative to the other part. This is not the actual absolute velocity. When you look at the absolute velocity, for instance, here it's five centimeters, yeah, for instance. So there are people who study these things. Um, again, this is another, another uh, representation in terms of, of um, uh, relative and absolute velocities. And you can see basically uh, you can see, I think, with yellow, let's see, well, uh, the yellow are absolute velocities, I think, and the white are relative velocities. Um, so you can, you can study this and, uh, and uh, see more or less how they move, the, these plates. Now, you may, might ask me, uh, and it would be a, a reasonable question, how would you know what the absolute, <laughs> I mean, the relative, you can imagine, you can devise an experiment. You can say, well, we can actually measure the distance. One plate is here, one plate is here. We have instruments uh, that could be very accurate now. So we can measure the distance between this point here and this point here. So we'd know the relative vel movement, relative velocity. How would we know the, the absolute one? So that's a good question. So we'll talk about this. In order to tell you how people infer the, abs the absolute velocities, let's talk a bit about hotspots. So the idea is that some people, uh, and this is uh, again controversial, but you have some areas of uh, persistent volcanism in one spot, for instance, and um, can be in, in um, the Earth's history. You have what's called large igneous provinces with the outpouring of a lot of lava. Uh, and for instance, uh, in Siberia, you have one of uh, such province in India, like really big ones. Uh, in India, it's called the um, Deccan Traps, uh, for instance. So people were saying that you have mantle plumes and mantle plumes are, um, how to put it, are, let's say, some currents of hot material that rises from the bottom of the mantle to the top and generates uh, magmatism uh, in the lithosphere. So it's very hot material that rises and these are called mantle plumes. Um, and the hot spots are uh, actually the product of mantle plumes. Um, so at the, ho at the hot spot, you have volcanism and in the uh, oceanic, oceanic lithosphere, you'd see 
various uh, manifestations of these volcanism as sea mounts or islands, volcanic islands. Um, so I'm mentioning here that most of these mantle plumes and hotspots are in the interior of plates. Now, some of them happen to coincide with a ridge, like a good example is Iceland. Iceland um, is, uh, it, it comes uh, right on the mid-ocean, Atlantic mid-ocean ridge. And it's considered that it's not only the ridge, it's a hotspot there that built Iceland. But most of these uh, hotspots are intraplate. And a very famous example is uh, the uh, Hawaiian archipelago. So let's see what happens. So you can see here, here you, you can imagine, uh, you have a current of hot material ascending and generating here um, magmatism. Now, let's look at, at, the, at something like in Hawaii, you see Hawaii. So the idea is, it is believed that these currents are fixed and that what happens is if you have a plate on top of it and it generates volcanism here now, so you, you create an island here, but then the plate moves and as it moves, it generates another volcanic island and then the plate moves and it generates another volcanic island. So that's how um, the formation of the uh, Hawaiian archipelago uh, occurred. So basically, the active volcano is here. Yes, you are right, David. David is always a bit <laughs> ahead of me. So the active volcano is right above the hotspot, and the other ones are no longer active. So the, uh, you, you can get the idea. You see it here uh, shown very nicely. You uh, see it here as an example, time one, time two, time three. So as David pointed out, the idea is you have only one zone with active volcanism, and this is already extinct. But what people can do, they can take samples and measure the age of the rocks, yeah, uh, when the volcanism occurred here and here and here, and then they can calculate how fast, yeah, what, what was the absolute velocity of the plate above the hotspot. So that's the idea, all right? So if you look at the um, Hawaiian archipelago, actually it's the ha Hawaii emperor chain. You can see the Hawaii chain and the emperor chain. So uh, you, you can imagine that basically the plate has been moving, but what's interesting, you see the ages here, 7.2 million, 10, 12, 19, and so on. So older and older ages. But as you can see, the direction of these two chains is different. So what we learn here is not only that the plate moved with a certain uh, speed above the hotspot, it also at some point changed the direction of movement. So initially it was like this, and then it was like this. Yeah, so, so actually we can see through this history that the plate changed its direction of movement. And of course, the change of the direction can be in the whole context, dynamic context, context of all this jigsaw puzzle yeah, and the reorganization or whatever happened. So this is, uh, I would say, very cool. And you see the details actually of the ages of the various islands uh, in the Hawaiian archipelago. So we have different hotspots and you can see we can use them as fixed reference points to determine the plate movements, so the direction of movement and the velocity by uh, measuring the ages of the volcanoes. So you can see at all this, so it's not only Hawaii and the emperor chain and Hawaiian chain, but you see many others. So people, there are people who focus on this and they provided the information that we are now integrating. All right, so I'd say that for today, uh, let's see what the time is. It's um, almost three o'clock. Uh, I'd say it's enough for today. We'll continue uh, next time uh, we, with the theory of plate tectonics. Uh, you can read about these things uh, in this textbook, um, these sections and these pages. If you have questions, please ask them. <laughs> Yes, of course, <laughs> that's what I was just saying. 
ask me questions now. Uh, teacher, could you please repeat uh, the part that you talked about the poles, something about the poles and the movements of plate tectonics before you start in talking about how much they yeah. moved? I couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, the, the, the poles. Let yes. me just uh, put this back here. Um, one moment. So the idea is that if you have a sphere, like Euler, what Euler said, he said we have a sphere. He didn't think about necessarily about the Earth. Yeah. The idea is if you have an object that moves on the surface of a sphere, that movement, uh, no matter how it moves, yeah. Today we are thinking about the Earth how it is, and it has a rotation axis. But the idea is, if you have an object that moves. Basically, you will have the theorem says you will have an axis relative to which the movement uh, occurs. Yeah, so so you have uh, basically a rotation axis relative to which this movement can be described, and this axis where it intersects the surface of the sphere that is called the Euler pole. So you you see it here. Let's say this is a, a continental piece and it moves from here to here. So this is the uh, Euler axis and this is the Euler pole. If it were to move uh, obliquely like from here to here, then we'd have somewhere here the Euler pole. So it has nothing to do with the, with the spin axis, with the geographic pole, as you can see it here. So you can imagine this theorem is used to describe the movement, so people who study the kinematics, the way the, the, uh, the, way the, the plates move and the directions in which they move now or in the past, they can describe this by pointing out where the pole, the rotation pole, if you want, is uh, that basically this movement can be referenced to. So this is basically the idea. It, it's just to introduce to you this concept of the Euler pole um, and I think Maria will talk a bit more in the laboratory course about it. All right, is that okay, David? Yes, sir, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. If you have other questions, David or uh, someone else, please uh, don't feel shy. If you don't, then have a Great afternoon. It's sunny here in Bogota where I am. So go and enjoy it. <laughs> uh, and I'll see you on Thursday. Yes, have a good day. Gabriel, uh, let me read this. Um, if we are static, then the rotational axis is a particular section of Euler's pole. Um, the, you mean the rotational axis? Yeah, well. <laughs> The Earth rotates, yeah. So we talk here about the rotation of the whole Earth when we talk about the spin axis. Whereas here, this is a geometric thing. So let's say if you had a geometric, geometrically, if you had uh, a plane going, let's say, from uh, New York uh, on the same parallel to Europe. So this plane uh, would have its rotation pole because it's on the parallel of the Earth, uh, of, the, of today's Earth, the rotation pole would, would be actually the actual geographic pole, yeah, the rotation axis. So you can imagine the parallels, if you want, refer to uh, the parallels, geographic parallels, refer to the rotation axis. But you can have a, an object moving, let's say, obliquely, moving from uh, North America to Africa, yeah, going obliquely. So the rotation, the, the rotation on the surface of the sphere of this object moving would be described by another axis, not the rotation axis of the Earth. Yeah, so I hope it makes sense. <laughs> yes, it is oblique. Yes, it is. <clears throat> okay, are you okay, Gabriel? Doing well? Thank you, teacher. Goodbye. Goodbye. Take care.